Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 270th New Social Environment. I'm Jess Chen, Events assistant, assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Federico Solmi and Dan Cameron. We're also thrilled to have the poet Erioan Noel here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that have lost their lives to this violence, and I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Federico Solmi lives and works in New York. Solmi's work utilizes bright colors and a satirical aesthetic to portray a dystopian vision of our present day society. His exhibitions often feature articulate installations composed of a variety of media, including video, painting, drawing, and sculpture. Solmi uses his art as a vehicle to stimulate a visceral conversation with his audience, highlighting the contradictions and fallibility that characterize our time. Dan Cameron is a New York-based curator, art writer, and educator whose career began with his 1982 New Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition, Extended Sensibilities, Homosexual Presence, and Contemporary Art, the first museum effort in the U.S. to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. During his 11 years as senior curator at the New Museum, Cameron organized survey exhibitions of David von Jurovich, Martin Wong, and Marcel Odenbach, among many others. Dan, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, it's really great to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Brooklyn Rail, it's, it's really an honor to be here, uh, to be able to talk to uh, Federico Solmi. Um, I only have known Federico personally for a couple of years, really a few years, but I am one of his uh, many ardent fans who walked into an exhibition of his work without knowing anything at all about what I was about to see. Uh, and I left that first viewing experience, that first encounter with Federico's work, um, a little bit, I don't wanna say shaken exactly, but a little bit destabilized because as a seasoned viewer, it's not all the time when I, I, I encounter something that I cannot explain. I don't know how it was made. I don't know what went into it uh, in terms of production. And also I feel like I've been introduced to a new way of looking at the world, a completely new way of looking at the world that's kind of forcing me to adapt to it, to sort of meet it halfway before I can you know, comprehend what it's trying to uh, uh, convey. And now that I know, Feder I mean, so from that first experience, I thought Federico Solmi was going to be a terrifying individual. I, I really thought this guy must be, have an attitude and be so aggressive and, um, you know, constantly spouting Marxist rhetoric and, 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 you know, just really, and then I met him and I thought, how is this person the author of this <laughs> work, the creator of this work? Um, so that's my brief introduction. Um, Federico, hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hey, nice to meet you guys. Well, first of all, I, you know, since I arrived in New York, the Brooklyn Rail was uh, such an important uh, uh, source of information for me. And uh, this is an incredible pleasure to be with you, Dan. And by the way, we met, uh, you met my work in 2016 at Luis de Jesus, Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, you know, that was for me a great, uh, a great encounter with you. Uh, since then, we've been always in touch and uh, we had the privilege to uh, communicate with you. For me, it's simply amazing. But, um, well, like, you know, I think that uh, what you say is a great compliment when you say that uh, you feel destabilized by seeing an artwork. Well, 
that's I think is uh, the best compliment you ever give it to me because uh, uh, in most of uh, um, the gallery and museum event uh, that I go, I never. It's very hard to feel uh, like shaken by by an artwork. So I feel like you know that uh, probably has to do with uh, the traditional academic training, uh, which uh, uh, somehow everybody is so well behaved. Like you know, so um, <laughs> you know, I'm a self-educated artist, but I also have the privilege to teach. Uh, for several years at Yale University, Yale School of Art, and Yale School of Drama. And uh, I see that this, uh, this attitude that you detected, I think it really comes from uh, being an outsider. Uh, an outsider in a way that, uh, not that I'm not uh, part of the art world, but, you know, I'm really embedded and really invested. But the thing is that, uh, you know, I have to do my own uh, uh, research. Uh, I did all of my own, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, work uh, without having a mentor, you know? And uh, probably at the beginning it's very painful and it's very difficult, but uh, when, you, when you get to have the experience and uh, you've been 20 years in New York, uh, you really feel that uh, it's a tremendous freedom that, uh, that not many artists has. So that's why I believe you see this body of work that is a sort of a combination of like painting, uh, drawings, uh, video animation combined by gaming technology with motion captures. So all of this, uh, all of this media that they are not supposed to be blended into one, to me came very naturally, like, you know, because uh, I never had someone that tell me not, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. So I simply like, you know, I'm very uh, hard head when I have something in my mind, uh, I like to go to the bottom. And I thought back in 2005, 2003, actually, uh, the gaming industry and gaming technology was becoming so fascinating to me. And, and I started to be a lawyer. I started to observe the development of digital technology and I'm not a technical person, uh, strictly, you know, I, I'm not very technical, but I, I understood that gaming technology, digital technology will change the world, you know, and that's, that's what I believe is really happening. Like, you know, if you think about the last 20 years of our life, it's been uh, shaped by just one thing, the technology that invaded our home, that invaded our uh, workplace. So, and I simply saw it as a great opportunity to, to be, uh, you know, to use these great tools that were coming into the mix. But I always use it without forgetting, like uh, the great tradition of uh, uh, all master painting, the great tradition of draftman. So I simply combine. Uh, yeah, I can we pause there for just a second? Because, um, you know, when you say that gaming, technology, the, 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 the gaming uh, techniques for visualizing the world and for creating a, a spatial experience uh, that the viewer navigates in. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that in a way, this is an extension of, of classical perspective of, of, of using, you know, an illusion instead Absolutely. of a two-point illusion, just something a little bit more um, able to fool the eye in different ways. Um, you know, it's, it's really, as you said, an extension of old master painting. And that's why I want to ask you to pause a second. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you're self-taught and yet you've been teaching at Yale. So mm -hmm. right away, that would, that would suggest an unusual trajectory uh, professionally. Where did you, see, you're from Bologna and I know you started out in a profession that really is about as far from being a video uh -huh. artist as one could imagine. Um, can you talk about that a little bit and maybe sort of give well, us some broad strokes how you wound up here in your studio today? Well, let's say that, uh, you know, like I had the privilege growing up that, uh, you know, what being in Bologna, like, you know, when I was five years old, you know, we would go to church and you have these incredible paintings, you know, for the first time I experienced like, you know, murder inside a church. You see like, you know, this, this figure of like, uh, uh, of like a religious uh, uh, story that, you know, they, they had a huge impact on me. But of course I didn't realize that I wanted to be an artist when I was five years old, you know? So I would say that, you know, 
I was entangled in a family uh, situation that uh, that uh, I didn't have the chance to to come to United States until I was 25. And when I came to United States when I was 25, it was too late to go to uh, you know to to go to college. You know, but in the meantime, since I you know I know that I was an artist, you know. I did uh, all the best that I can do from uh, like, you know, 18 to 25 to educate myself uh, through books, uh, through see exhibition, through go and talk to uh, the few artists that I, I met. And then once I was finally ready to, uh, to leave Italy, I came to New York uh, starting from zero, you know? And, uh, and, you know, again, it was very hard, but at the same time, it was uh, also an incredible privilege because uh, you, you have a complete freedom of, uh, of mixing whatever uh, you think, uh, uh, you know, uh, fulfill you. Like, you know, so I remember one of my first gallery told me, oh, Federico, it's a very bad idea to be, to mix paintings with video. I say, why, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I felt like, you know, this, uh, this tremendous freedom that I had, uh, it helped me to create what, uh, what you see in the studio, like, you know, so, uh, Sure, Italy had a big impact on me for, uh, you know, the tradition of the draftman, you know, but of course, uh, you know, what I was trying to say, like in my artwork, uh, you know, was not just to paint a beautiful picture, you know, it was simply to try to, you know, to talk about the issue that in society, they bother me, like, you know, the issue that uh, they afflict uh, a lot of uh, uh, people, often in a very negative way. So I think I realized that I was, uh, uh, an artist when I wanted to use my artwork not as a decorative uh, uh, element of a house but simply to I want to tell story I wanted to tell story and that's how I started to you know create my first video animation uh, using simply drawings and then step by step I get into like you know to uh, to discover technology discover gaming technology and the idea is it, it was very simple like you know what really struck me was that you know with gaming technology someone could represent a world a parallel world that was that resembled the what the one in which we were living but you can also do tweak you can also modify like you know the meaning of a historical event the meaning of issue they are in society. So I was, I was terribly attracted to uh, control this technology in order with my painting to create, you know, a parallel universe. You know that you know a, a metaphysical space in which I could tell my 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 narrative. But it wasn't gaming per se that appealed to you. I mean, it's not like you're a gamer who's looking no. for an opportunity. To I always been a voyeur. I always been a voyeur. I always been a voyeur. I always, I always look uh, at things that you know. How can I use them in into into my work? I, I, I was never. I was never really a gamer, like, you know. But Fred, isn't it also safe to say, I know this is a little yeah. obvious, but it might not be to everyone that video games are not meant. To, I did not made, pardon me, by starting with painting. People don't usually sit down with a brush and paint and begin to yeah. create a world that's going to appear in a video game using traditional painting tools or techniques. Or am I completely wrong? Is in fact that how it starts? Well, to me, I'm telling you, like, you know, at the early phase of uh, digital media, you know, you have a lot of artists who are just simply playing and uh, recording video game footage and present it into gallery setting. You know, to me- I mean, the Korean Angel model. The, 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 there was not my nature. You know, I always wanted to use my own sensibility. And I felt that, you know, technology in few years will, will look like age. So that's why I start to uh, basically uh, replacing every uh, digital texture with hand painted texture that they were scanned into a computer. So, because, you know, I have my own aesthetic, like, you know, I wanted to see that, uh, that people from a mile away, they recognize that this is a work of mine, like, you know, and I felt that, you know, this uh, extreme uh, uh, devotion that I have to the history of painting, the history of draftsmanship, 
I, I couldn't separate the two. I thought about it. Well, I'm an artist in the 21st century and uh, uh, I believe if I want to make uh, uh, something remarkable, I have to uh, be very knowledgeable about uh, what uh, uh, came before me and also using all of the tools that, uh, that uh, they are available in, uh, in, uh, in today. But I wasn't able to separate them and I wasn't interested to separate. So to me, I figured out how to domesticate technology, how to make it instead of like cold and, um, and like uh, obsolete, I blended with uh, the organic painting texture and drawings and motion capture. Uh, and I create something that uh, is very, is very down to earth. It's very, it, you kind of feel you want to touch it, you know? And that <laughs> is a feeling that doesn't happen with digital media. Right, and just to clarify, we're, we're looking at six screens behind you and the work behind yeah. you. And every surface, every detail of every surface on every object, every character, yes. and every part of the architecture began as something that you painted by hand. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first began with, uh, of course, uh, a conceptual idea that I have, or what I want to say in a piece like this. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there is a lot of like uh, time consuming, uh, work both in the digital uh, uh, field and in the painting field. So, um, and also one of the things I'm very proud of, and unfortunately because you see from a distance, you don't see very well. Uh, it actually looks gonna... great. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> on okay. My screen, it looks, okay. The piece in the background well, looks spectacular. <laughs> well, well, since I'm a big fan of also of early cinema, um, uh, one of the most important elements of, of this uh, work that you see behind me is that the animation, most of them, they're not digital animation. Simply, uh, myself or one of my assistants, we went to perform in a motion capture lab and we were recording the movement of our body and we transferred into uh, the character we created in the studio. So to me, it's very important also to transfer through the movement of the body, the performative element that just, just an actor can have. So, and this to me, came from um, my, you know, a love for early cinema in which when actors, they couldn't speak, they were conveying meaning through the movement of their body. So we use a, at the studio together with my assistant, like we use very simple gesture that they are replacing also the spoken word. And this, I'm, I'm very proud uh, of this because uh, I, I really like, you know, the most difficult thing and the biggest question that I think uh, mankind will have in the future is, uh, are we going to be overwhelmed and strangled by technology or are we going to be able to domesticate technology? We're going to be able to coexist and still have control of our future because the, the pace that we're going today, I mean, in 15 years, I mean, we are nobody, you know, we will completely be replaced by AI, you know, uh, you know, AI artists probably like, you know, our machines and, uh, will come and eat us, basically. Yeah, yeah. They'll so, have us for lunch. So and to me, I think like, you know, one of the questions, the big question that uh, I think, you know, I don't want to go too deep in, in this kind of question, but I feel like, you know, uh, we, we realize that there's no more limit about, you know, this computer. So I think it's like, how can we coexist in harmony with the, this machine, you know? So, and in a way, this is a response, like, you know, to all of the biggest questions that I have, that you have a hand-painted uh, installation uh, with the five synchronized uh, uh, video animation that they are using all of this incredible technology, and uh, but then they are all painted and they are the movement of the body, and um, you know, and this there is one thing I want to I need to make a big thanks for. I don't want it to forget. So this installation. It came to me sort of like as a gift, you know, because when we were at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, I had all of many exhibitions scheduled and most of the museums that I supposed to exhibit, you know, they call it quit for the pandemic. But then there was uh, Mary Salvante, the curator from the Rowan University Gallery in New Jersey, that she, she said, no, Federico, let's keep going, like, let's keep going. And, you know, this piece kept me busy for six months and, uh, and probably like, who knows what would have happened? I think like, you know, uh, the fact that Mary, she was able to move forward, taking a lot of risks, she gave me the possibility to, 
to stay focused and give me the possibility to hire four assistants to help me to do this. And I feel like, you know, that start this whole good cycle that I feel I am, uh, I am right now, that, you know, I've been very productive during the pandemic. And, and, you know, that for a lot of people it was very hurtful, like, you know, so, but that is a special thanks I have to give to Mary, like, you know, which by the way, they always do great exhibition in, uh, over there. Anyway. I would say that I would, I would, I would even put a third hand tag onto that because I remember when your show was opening. At, yeah. at Rowan University. I remember thinking, wow, things must be starting to get back to normal. You know, because well, no. <laughs> no, they weren't, but but I could start to visualize how it would be again, you know, like that you were having a show and it well, was going on and, and it didn't seem to stop you and it didn't seem to well, stop uh, her. Yeah, I mean, for me, for mental health, you know, it was great, you know, because uh, when you have like, uh, uh, like something like this that I occupied like six months, you know, just this piece, you know, it really helped me to to forget about what was going on outside the world. You know, I would come here every day, like, you know, and, and I have people uh, working remotely with videos and, you know, and it was great, you know. So and now this exhibition, this piece is going to LA and, and my new exhibition, Luis de Jesus, uh, which will open in a new space uh, uh, no on time. April 24th, you know? So I'm very excited about that, so. That is really exciting. Um, I, I, I sort of want to keep picking away at this idea of space and how you introduced it, but you know, I think it'd be easier if we just went right to the slideshow and we sort of walked sure. um, our guests through the, the images, because I think they really, uh, in a way, speak for themselves and they're not overwhelming. Um, what do you think? And we can just talk each other through them. So we're okay. switching now over to the, uh, um, to the slideshow. Um, so this piece is very meaningful for me because uh, uh, back in uh, 2017, when I was warming up uh, the plan to do uh, this very large show in Kansas City, um, you said, <laughs> you know, we can do this. Uh, it's a nine channel video, uh, but we could do it. And, and I just remember sort of looking, I think I, you only accessed like a couple of screens like one or two stories yeah. I think maybe I saw 15 20 seconds yeah. and I just said I must I don't care how we do this we have to do this somehow in Kansas City so can you talk through its original um presentation here in Frankfurt yeah this is we're looking at an image of uh, um the great farce in the name of the video the installation and uh, it was presented for the first time at B3 Biennale in Frankfurt in the Schauspiel Opera House in, um, uh, in Germany. So what we look uh, basically is like a, a nine channel uh, installation that is completely occupying the, uh, uh, the main square of the city, one of the main square of the city. And to me, what I really enjoy very much was that uh, uh, to see like the people that were getting off of a train, people that were walking on the street, how they were interacting with the world. Because of course, uh, one of the uh, goal of, uh, of creating this uh, uh, large installation is to, uh, you know, to do some social commentary work and, uh, and to try to engage with the viewer. And, you know, to be honest, I also, I was very impressed the fact that uh, we didn't receive any complaint, you know, because it was completely like an invasion of like, uh, of like, uh, of to the city. And I remember that the, the volume was kind of loud. Um, and that was my first, uh, um, you know, larger uh, public uh, projection. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was quite a bit of work. Uh, so uh, I have, uh, I have the support of this, of the Biennale that they provide a good amount of funding to create this big installation. But uh, yeah, I can talk for hours. Like, you know, I remember that uh, one of the uh, main source of inspiration, especially for the difficulty of the display, which is very long and narrow, was uh, to study uh, a 1933 film by Ab Abel Gans, Napoleon. Oh, sure. That was a movie that, uh, it really had a big impact in me because it was the, for the first time a filmmaker was able to project the three screens simultaneously. And basically this is the installation is composed by three triptychs, so pretty much. And so it's also, nine channels, but it's three sort of segments in a way. Exactly, and in few occasions, you have a screen that become nine. It was, was, yeah. was a 
very challenging, very challenging work to conceive. And then, um, so we ended up, I invited you to participate in open spaces and we were lucky enough to get the um, collaboration of UMKC and their main art gallery, which yeah. involved more of a wraparound uh, installation as I think you can see in the next, uh, the next image. Um, Jess, if you can move it forward. Which, right. uh, Go ahead. Yeah, which for me was a, a very important step because basically I moved from a public uh, um, installation into like an immersive space, which by the way, this is a big impact of me when I started to work on VR, you know. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the idea of like creating a video projection um, inside, uh, it, there were two big rooms, it was a, a sort of like a first experiment to, to create VR work for me then. So which, which as you know, uh, after I started to work a lot with VR, so. Uh, you mean the wraparound? Yes, yes, because at the end, because at, you know, because at the end, like, you know, a wraparound installation uh, basically bring you inside the work. In, instead, when you are in front of a, a video installation, like when I have behind me, you sort of like a spectator. I think like with a wraparound, uh, installation, you become a sort of like a participant of, 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 the, of the view. And we'll have, you know, other example in the next few slides. Of, uh, mm -hmm. Let's run this video if we can, of the great forest. Yeah. I think it's a minute or something like that. I'll go make a sandwich. Bring back good memory. <laughs> Wonderful memories. I, sp I spent so much time in this room. Yeah, people are Sometimes really as a curator, you just make a piece so that you can see it. I mean, or you commission a piece so that you can sit back and soak it up for weeks at a time. Yeah. Actually, this piece now is displayed, and uh, not in this uh, gigantic version, is displayed at the Philips Collection for the 100 year anniversary exhibition. So we, it, it is, is on now. So. And this is uh, pretty amazing to me to be part of such a museum that uh, they open it up to this, uh, you know, this kind of work, you know. Oh, you know when, I, when, I, when I went like, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, at the Phyllis collection, you know, I would go there to see the Van Gogh, to see the, you know, like uh, uh, Jacob Lawrence. Uh, and now, you know, also them, they, they're opening up to uh, experimental, uh, let's say most experimental work, you know, and they're really into it, you know, I think, uh, I really think it's going to be, you know, something more is on, on the pipeline with the Philips collection. Beautiful. Well, I, uh, we, can, we can move ahead one more slide, I think. Um, I did notice in the, in the Washington Post the other day that that's one of the few museums right now in D.C. that are open. To the yeah. Public. So if you're going to D.C. and you want to see art, there's yeah. only a handful of places because. Uh, yeah. Cool. And I would love to see that uh, again. It's nice because it's such a quiet museum. One of the first things that you notice when you enter into, into the museum is the, is the sound of, of the piece. Now here's uh, Times Square. Yep, you were there too. <laughs> I was there. That was a great night. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this piece and how it came about? Well, um, it came about, uh, uh, well, it was, a, was, a, was strange, you know, because uh, of course, when you, when, you, when you take over, like, you know, Times Square and all of the screen, you have uh, you have of course uh, an issue with censorship, you know. So and uh, and of course I didn't want it to to create something that would create a you know I don't know a scandal or like some kind of like outrage, and uh, and uh, you know like step by step I start to think about it that uh, that instead of using like uh, you know this uh, grotesque character and this uh, you know historical figure. I thought that I will use the screen of Times Square as a mirror of like uh, what is Times Square, you know? And I felt like, you know, since uh, I came to New York in 1999, Times Square, I always had a weird relation, you know? And of course, I'm, I was extremely attracted about the colorful and exuberant characteristic, uh, which is also one of my characteristics. But uh, I also was, uh, you know, uh, attracted to the extreme, uh, 
demonstration of capitalism and waste and and uh, you know uh, business uh, and um, I, I decide that you know for the first time I believe in my career I, I would never use any of the character but I create this sort of like uh, circus of like festivity by the same time like you know I feel there is an element of critique of like this very exuberant uh, uh, advertisement uh, uh, sign and you know it's just like a sort of like a, a satirical interpretation of uh, of what capitalist America in its extremist form it is you know so um, I, I think they the the public has, has a good time, you know, because it was very playful, very colorful, you know, so. It's fascinating to look at this slide from only um, less than two years ago and, and start yeah, to years ago, yeah. from time when Times Square was full of people and there were Broadway shows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we went there at night. Um, but no, I, this is an this is a remarkable piece in part because of the, just the scale of being able to fill up so much public space. And it was at one minute to midnight, correct? Every day? Yeah, it was playing every, no, from uh, 11.57 to midnight. I think it was three minutes is night. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Oh, that's what we have behind. <laughs> hey, <laughs> well, now that we have the still Im image of it, can you uh, talk a little bit about the, the structure of the piece and the characters? Yeah, so basically you have, um, you know, what, what is the bathhouse? Is, uh, it's an extravagant, extravagant party that they happen into like a glamorous uh, villa that somehow recall uh, the Roman uh, architecture with mosaic and, you know, and of course the center uh, element of uh, the bathhouse is, uh, is like a Roman ancient spa. That's what it is. And we have all of these characters from, uh, you know, founding father to Alexander the Greek to Julius Caesar to like Cortes and you know religious leader from different age that they all meet together in this extravagant uh, lavish party and they let themselves go to to complete the generation so that's more or less is like uh, what is the theme of the of the piece so you have uh, this uh, leader from 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago to contemporary society that uh, they are dressed like, uh, you know, like with their uh, armor, but also they look like uh, popular icons. So you have a lot of like sunglasses, jewelry that they are popping up from their body. They all having a terrific time and us, you know, of course us, the people, the citizen, we just look at them with, uh, you know, with great distance because that's not the life that unfortunately we are part, you know. So um, it's, uh, it's uh, I believe, one of the best pieces, uh, you know, I've done. Um, and uh, it's very funny, it's very ironic. There is a lot of metaphor that uh, I hope the viewer, you know, will uh, get engaged and to solve uh, this kind of like, uh, uh, irony that is, is behind all of these pieces, and uh, you know that's uh, kept me quite quite a bit busy during the pandemic. You know, so and I'm very excited about showing it. And this this perspective, um, which I want to kind of uh, deconstruct a little bit if we can, because uh, it repeats itself in other works, including in the Great Farce, which mm -hmm. is when when the ruling class, we we'll call yes. them point one percent. Um, you know, when they get together, when the, when the doors are closed and, and, and no one can see, you know, of course, they behave with the most extreme um, acts of decadence and, and, and self-indulgence. Um, and yeah. I'm curious about how, um, well, and also, sorry, going back to like the Great Forest, how, you know, when yeah. the conquerors, you know, enter, the natives uh, are there waiting to see them. They're jumping up and down in joy uh, to, to embrace them. And so there's, there's almost this comically exaggerated idea of the perspective of the oppressor where, you know, we're not, a, we're not seeing what comes, what are the consequences of the actions of these powerful decadent um, people. All we're seeing is them letting down their hair and having a good time and yeah. enjoying the fruits of their 
you know, their theft and extortion. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I'm intrigued by this, you know, as a sort of an end of empire point of view or end of empire commentary. And I, I think maybe it gets to the part of, or to the heart, pardon me, of, of what you're talking about, which is the, the politics of your art and how you're commenting on things you don't like. Well, obviously, like, you know, when you do something that is so political oriented, I think you start with, uh, with an idea that there's a lot of things that are wrong in society, like, you know, because otherwise, you know, I will simply paint beautiful pictures that, you know, would be a much easier career too, probably, like, you know, so, and I mean, of course, there is a tradition of like uh, artists starting from, you know, century ago, that they use their hands to, to try to destabilize power, you know. Of course, you know, I, I don't believe that with my art or I will be able to destabilize, you know, a government, you know. But I do believe that, uh, that through criticizing and through speak out about things that they are, uh, you know, failing in our society, it definitely art as, as the characteristic of pers persuas persuasion that will uh, will help to trigger you know the mind of people to maybe look at history in a more uh, in, a, in a deeper way so let's say that you know that uh, when i was working at the gray fire so when i was working at the series like in 2015 the brotherhood i remember the level of discomfort that uh, people had to see my work because I was criticizing pretty much the way that American history was narrated, you know? And back in 2015, it was not so cool to talk about colonialism, to talk about, uh, you know, like uh, Native American, how they were exploited, to talk about how African American they were exploited. So I felt really, really lonely, to be honest, you know? So, and now suddenly, like, you know, is becoming the you know the biggest trend to 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 criticize uh, this Eurocent you know this ethnocentric view of history and this white supremacist view of history. But I remember, like in 2015, I was really lonely. Like you know, I was always like you know, I always had hard time. Uh, people were giving me a hard time. Like you know, so to me, it was simply like a process. Uh, that I, 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 I an, an adventure that I did, I said, the only way to become a, a remarkable artist working in America was to really understand the society in which I was living, like, you know. So, and that's why I started to read, you know, all of these books like uh, A People History of United States by Howard Dean, or uh, Opens Vein of Latin America by Eduardo Galeano, and, you know, and countless, other sources to educate myself into the country, which I'm still like a guest, you know, I've been here for 20 years, you know, but uh, I feel that my relation with, uh, with the United States is, uh, is, is a fantastic relation, but I'm still probably like, you know, I, I, I feel I would never be American. That's what it is, you know, and that gave me also the freedom to interpret historical events in a very open, you know, open way, because I don't feel the pressure like many other American people has to, you know, to talk and shows the dark side of, of the society in which we are. Because I do believe that, uh, you know, all of the issue in American society, there are a consequence of starting with some very shaky foundation, like, you know, and uh, that's what I'm interested in. Like, you know, I, I really care about, uh, you know, art, but I also really care about, uh, you know, the, the, the environment and the history that they nurture me, so. Well, I also think that you have, um, I mean, in terms of the limitations that you've created for yourself by, but through this medium where, you know, there's no text, there's no dialogue, you know, the, you, the only way that we can relate to these characters is through this visualization of them. Absolutely. Which, you, which you've made, um, just for the sake of argument here, let's say intentionally crude, intentionally um, re repellent. And yet, I mean, as I'm looking at this image right now, I, I'm thinking yeah. a lot about the kind of notion of bread and circuses. 
uh, because it doesn't really look like we're looking at corrupted political leaders. It almost looks like we're just having another moment of celebrity culture. Absolutely. Where, where instead of, you know, they're all wearing sunglasses. And, you know, and so instead of looking at what political and corporate leaders do in their actions, we tend as a society to completely trivialize all public life and instead look at celebrities and their spats and their divorces and their courtships and their, you know, and, and, and I'm, this feels like both of those things at the same time. It's almost like you've taken away the, or you've collapsed the two ideas together so that, you know, ruthless politicians and sort of um, empty headed celebrities become the same thing. They are the same thing. You've kind of fused them into one, like they're all Ivanka Trump. Absolutely, because also if you think about it, you know, we're all complicit into this, especially in the nurturing the celebrity culture. Like, in, and, and by the way, like somebody went up to vote for Trump or Biden or whatever you think, but you know, we are complicit in all of this. There is no question about it, like, you know, and uh, I simply like, you know, uh, like to create this narrative to, to make sure that uh, uh, people, you know, uh, they are aware of like, uh, of like uh, that, you know, about this, this uh, critics that I make to, to the leadership, but also probably to myself and to us that they were, we are allowing this, you know, because uh, um, especially like this uh, idolization of the celebrity is something that, uh, it could be very obnoxious, like, you know, I think create a lot of like uh, negative, uh, negative, negative, uh, you know, like uh, result in our society, but no matter what, we, we still do it, you know, so uh, I, I, I simply think that, you know, again, I'm, I'm really embedded in American society way more than, than uh, my country when I'm coming from, you know, I live here and completely uh, love where I am. I, I don't think I, I can ever work anywhere outside New York. And, um, and I think I examine like, you know, a theme in different angles, you know? Yeah, I bet exactly. Um, I, I wanna dive in and sort of connect this as well to the way that you use gaming technology. Because mm -hmm. one of the things that I was thinking about before is that the reason these spaces that you carve out and articulate are familiar to us is if you play with like first shooter games or any kind yes. of game, you know about this activity of flying through the spaces, you know, and, and directing yourself, you know, on a jet or something through the spaces yeah. where you're conquering things and, and, and shooting people down and, and, and moving on to the next stage of your, um, your triumph, your victory. And, and, and what you're doing by contrast is you're creating these very enveloping spaces which are very seductive, but you know, they're really hideous, Federico. It's like you try, rather than wanting to fly around in those spaces with those characters, it's like you're trying to pull us into a world that we don't want to go in because it's really scary. And these people are really scary. And if they pull us in, they're going to eat us all. And, and so it's, it's a weird, you've yeah. created weird love hate friction where but, you're fascinated with the, characters in the world, but we're repelled by them. We're really- But, but I'll take it as a compliment. You know, I feel like, you know, the fact that they're, they're very seductive. Like, you know, I mean, it's not easy to be seductive with digital technology. Usually they are, it's so cold, so like, you know, detached. Uh, well, to me, again, like, you know, uh, the digital technology, it's just like, uh, it's just one, one, one piece of, uh, of, the, of the element. So to me, when I am inside uh, this, uh, um, you know, universe that I'm creating at a studio, I really think as a, a filmmaker from the 1920 that creates all of this uh, stage and as the opportunity to, to create all of these actors and, uh, and really like, you know, I really enjoy go with the camera and capture this, you know, like intimate moment and intimate dialogue with gesture that uh, that occur between these uh, these leaders. So, I, you know, like you know, digital technology is is everywhere. To me, my goal is to bring digital technology uh, 
and to be accepted as a form of art, you know, like that, that that's, that's, that's what, uh, that is, that what is my mission, like, you know, and, and of course to be absolutely unique and then can people recognize a work of mine from a miles away, you know, <laughs> and that to me is really the goal because when, when I go to, you know, a museum of uh, like, you know, uh, like the Met, I recognize from 100 meters what is a Masaccio and what is a Guido Reni and what is a Picasso. So to me, I'm so invested into, into create my, my own secluded universe and the way that I uh, convey the meaning that, that, and the aesthetic that that I think is my primary uh, primary goal. Like you know, no matter what, if I do it with the drawings, which uh, I think we're going to see in or, a minute, uh, or like I did lately into a VR experience. You know, so I think that you know, uniqueness is a way to fight against this uh, current uh, moment of the art in which. A lot of the artists, like, you know, they follow following simply like a trend that, uh, you know, of the moment. So to me, you know, I, I never look at art this way. To me, art is a unique way to express and to convey meaning. It can happen with aesthetic, can happen with, uh, um, you know, like a, a vehicle, like a VR or a, a video installation, you know. To me, I'm creating my own universe, which I hope that, you know, uh, people, you know, will enjoy and, uh, and uh, will question themselves about what I'm trying to say. That, that, that's, that's pretty much what I'm trying to say, you know. Um, I want to move on to the next image, if we can, because I think we don't, we don't have a, that much more, but we have a couple of uh, representative examples of just what you're talking about, um, both in terms of the uh, VR work that you're doing. Um, oh, this is a trailer of... Uh, of what we have behind oh, the bathhouse. Um, should we look at it for a bit? Um, I, because there's yeah, something I, I want to. Yeah, I think like we, there's something I want people to notice, which is that the surfaces of all of your characters uh, and and objects and texture they need to flicker, right? Yes. They they, they flicker, and yes. this is where the primitive early cinema I think idea comes in. Absolutely. Where they they can't just remain one color; they have to keep oscillating. So Basically, what, why is that? What, what, what's well, happening? Technically speaking, is this like you know? Of course, like you know, uh, you know. For example, again, we go back to 1933 uh, King Kong movie. Uh, I remember like one of the most. I mean, what I was really attracted, you know, that the, the first few seconds before the title credit, you have all of this uh, flickering of the film, you know, and uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, this. This technique, that, again, is like a way to fight the flatness of digital technology, you know, and to me, maybe these are irrelevant details for many people, but for me are extremely important. You no, know? they're fascinating. Like, look at his helmet. Look at his tricolor right there and the black surfaces and the way they keep shifting. And then at one moment yeah. it's green and another moment it's purple and then another moment it's black again. And, yeah. and as you say, this this so basically, te technically speaking, when I paint uh, uh, one texture, um, it gets scanned three times. So in order that uh, we are, you know, at the studio when, when, when we mount the video, this texture is cycling three times. So basically, for each character, there are more or less 10 to 12 uh, painted to be created. Plus, you have to multiply by three because, you know, the texture has to be touch three times. It's a very time consuming. Right, so you, uh, so could you say that one more time? For every character, there have to be 12 paintings? From every character, uh, I was wondering if I have some- We can move ahead, by the way, with the image. We, I think we can- From go. every character, we have uh, more or less 10 to 12, 11 by 17 painting, okay? And for every character, each texture has to be painted, painted and modified by me three times in order we do three scan in order that we cycle the texture three times and everything this you see same it's incredible i mean just looking at the detail of one screen for a minute and 17 seconds is yes. just a 
I, you know, it's just a rapturous sort of experiment experience. It just it's a, it's a so man man It's so rich in detail. Yeah, thank also, you. Also, I like the uh, translucency. You know, the fact that we can see yes. through many layers of color. Um, yes. Ah, so here's your show at at. Rowan That's my University. show at uh, Rowan University Gallery. That, you know, this is a partial view, but uh, you know, in the uh, way at the really end, you see a twenty six by twenty feet painting. Which is sort of like a, it's kind of like a, a satirical version of like a, a history painting, okay? And uh, and um, you know, you, you know, it's, it was it was the exhibition that I created during the pandemic, and it was my God, like you know, it was a bless again, like you know. And uh, some of this work, they're moving now to LA to open this exhibition at Luis de Jesus in Los Angeles. And the title is The Bacchanalian Ones, which I really like the, the title, of mm -hmm. course. Which again, connects a little bit to the bathhouse in the sense of this sort of... Uh, uh, absolutely. Belgian also connect, connect a lot with the, like, you know, of course, like, you know, Dionysus, like, you know, uh, Frederick Nietzsche was obsessed with uh, Dionysus. And, uh, and of course, like, you know, a lot of painter, they create like, you know, the triumph of Bacchus, like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is that to create a show in which you show that this leader, their only goal is to let um, she unleash themselves, you know, to the pleasure of life. That's pretty much what is the theme of the exhibit, you know? Um, so the purpose of achieving power over others it's Absolutely. Not to, it's not to benefit the world. It's Absolutely. To benefit yourself. Absolutely. To go wild and to go unleash. And but suffer no consequences. That, 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 you know, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's a lot of the drive that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of politicians had. You know, that's a fact. Like, you know, who wanted to conquer, like, you know, um, you know, a particular part of the world, who wanted to conquer wealth. So that, that's how... I, I don't discover anything in this, in this, you know, in this. I just like to amplify this concept. Uh, let's keep going uh, to the next image. So these are, we saw them in detail in the center of the gallery. Yes. Now we're seeing them close up. This is yes. how you're doing VR. So this is, a, you know, I had the pleasure of having uh, the Rowe University Engineering Department to work with me. And basically the goal was to uh, create a VR experience and make it very unique. So, and basically I thought, wow, what about like, you know, the viewers that are coming to the, to the museum, they are not just looking at a VR experience, but they simply also wear a mask and they sort of like becoming the participant of, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this exhibit. And uh, well, you know, I, I really enjoy it. And, uh, and uh, I think, you know, like, uh, even if we are under a pandemic was, uh, you know, people react very well. So, and uh, now uh, I create a new VR experience, which where I'm using a much more sophisticated machine, which is called the Oculus Quest 2. And uh, this mask will, they will be exhibit as simply as sculpture. And the viewer will sit down in a chair and using a VR experience uh, with, uh, because the, the latest VR experience is so much better, like, you know, uh, and the issue is that uh, uh, the Oculus Quest 2, they have camera that are pointing to the bottom of the, of the headset, and somehow with this current mask, uh, uh, there is, there's sort of like an obstacle for, uh, for uh, using the controller. So, uh, ah. but, but, but that was, that was a, a great uh, first phase of this project, which I'm working in, and I know how to solve it in the future. Uh, but uh, yeah, this was the phase one. But then one could quite easily envision a future iteration where there's sort of eight characters, um, each Absolutely. one a different spectator, moving around in the same VR experience, and yes. they're actually disguised as characters within the world, within the- Absolutely. This is just phase one, and I'm already super happy that we were able to, 
to create, uh, I think, a great experience. And uh, the next phase, actually, what I'm hoping to do within April 24, to be able to have people from home, which they own an Oculus Quest 2, to have access from home and experience uh, the same the same VR experience that the people experience at the gallery. So I'm not there yet, but I'm really pushing hard that everywhere uh, in the in the world they can connect uh, and experience the bathhouse remotely. So I'm just waiting for uh, uh, some permission, you know, and uh, hopefully it's going to happen before the day of the exhibition. And when you say experience the bathhouse remotely, could I dumb that down a little bit and say, you'll have the experience of walking around inside that world as one of the characters? Absolutely. You have the, you have the, this is already happening in the gallery. Okay. So I'm simply trying to try to upload this, uh, this VR experience into a server, into a VR community that will allow everyone, anyone that own an Oculus Quest 2 to basically being the narrator, enter into this world and make decision. So you can go and decide if you want to go and smoke a cigar with uh, George Washington, if you want to go and have a drink uh, with, uh, you know, Alexander the Great. Uh, and of course, you can simply be just be a voyeur to experience all of this madness, you know, and just be a part. And what to me is very interesting is this, is that when you look at the bathhouse here, you're simply a spectator and you're just like staring of what you, your, position, your, position is fixed. your position is fixed. Your position yes. doesn't move. Yeah. Right. While with the VR experience, which is the title of the show, the Bacchanalian ones, mm -hmm. you have controller, you can go inside the pool, navigate, go wherever you want and become the narrator. So that, that that's to me is really the thing that triggered my mind, you know. And is it safe to say, Fed, that that um, all of these years building a dimensional world, a spatial experience based on video games, made it maybe a little bit easier for you to adapt your process to virtual reality, to VR? Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. it seems like you're already halfway there by having done it the hard way, by having well, done it well, like piecemeal almost a well, craftsmanship the, approach. Well, the way that I see it is this. I always been seen as the eccentric one, as the one that was doing weird things. Now, finally, the time has catch up with, with what I do. That, that's, you know, I, I don't see like, uh, I don't see in a different way. I never felt the weird or the eccentric. I just felt the artist that was really taking his job seriously, you know, taking advantage of what the 21st century was offering me. That's it, you know with really uh, great difficulty sometimes and, uh, you know, great stress. But, uh, you know, it was so obvious that the technology was going this direction, you know, so that, 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 that's, that's very, and it's also so obvious that the new generation, the 15 years old, the 12 years old, they will consume art and artwork and see exhibition in a completely different way from our generation, then you know that, that that's so obvious. Like you know, they'll slap on one of these and walk around to <laughs> to virtual. Then, I, I don't think I don't think that the future is just in the VR. But I can tell you this: I think it's a great privilege to be for an artist to be able to express himself with a video installation, with a painting, with a VR, with anything. Like you know, why not? Why not? Well, speaking of going really weird and way out on a limb and taking extraordinary risks, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> well, this is just a little details, by the way. Eh? A little detail. Well, this is like a 16,000 square feet room in China at the Ocean Flower Museum, which uh, is about to open a massive exhibition with eight international artists. And basically then, this is the great farce which has been adapted. And believe it or not, they, I, I, I never thought in my life, they told me, Federico, your installation is too small. You know, you have to create additional, additional video 
to wrap to around this, giga this gigantic room. So, and basically what we did, we create an additional three video to wrap around this circular room. And also I create all of the, the projection that go in the floor. So this is gonna be like a massive uh, experience. It can be a thousand people going inside this uh, this art world and which is you know it's basically i i call it like you know a sort of like a a shared vr experience because it's a complete immersive experience i think there are 40 40 projectors that have been used to to create okay. and, and this is the first exhibition that ever been exhibited in this museum it's opening with this piece yes yes and um yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty crazy project. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, let's move on just real quick to the next slide because this was actually what I wanted to uh -oh. um, sort of end with because I, you know, I came by a couple months ago um, with Fong and, and you showed us these new uh, drawings and, and I'm just stunned because again, it's like you've done everything and now you're making drawings and they're exquisite works on, on wood. Well, what drawings, I think, has always been the center. Not, not often I was able to show it, you know. And now, in this case, what you see, uh, I basically, you know, I've been exposed to all of this digital imagery, like, for so many years. And, and now, I've always been fascinated about this polygonal space and about this uh, uh, digital skeleton. And, and I said to myself, like, you know, and also thanks to the pandemic, you know, because I was really able to concentrate and focus, you know, and I was able to open a second studio just dedicated to drawings. And I thought I wanted to bring to life some of this vi virtual assets and digital skeleton that I've been playing around for decades. And I wanted to bring it into life in a, in a very, unique and drafty way. So basically what you see, they are not really accurate polygonal figure, of course, because if you, if, if, a, if a 3D um, animator or designer look at, this, at these drawings, then they, they are completely inaccurate. But what I wanted to use was really to create this atmosphere that they are recalling the etching of Rembrandt, uh, the drawing of George Sero, the etching of Morandi. I wanted to create this sort of like magical atmosphere uh, and then introduce into this magical metaphysical atmosphere imagery that they are a bit destabilizing, you know, because people that are not used to see, you know, drawings, you know, that they are coming from, you know, uh, virtual sources, you know. so. Uh, that's that's to me, you know, like uh, uh, was a, is a very important step, and this is just the beginning, you know, because uh, I just started like a few months ago. And hey, Fed, isn't that guy on the right the QAnon shaman? Well, there, there is a, definitely like a, this kind of like joke, you know, that uh, because I was thinking at the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, from exactly. Europe, but, but 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 of course I didn't want to even use their, his uh, perspective or his composition. Uh, you know, I actually like, you know, uh, compose in Photoshop, uh, it's sort of like a bizarre uh, image and, um, and step by step it became uh, what it is today. This is actually a big drawing, 60 inch wide, you know? Beautiful. And I think it we just have one more. Like a month, by the way. It took you a, a month. month. No, I know the, the detail is, is extraordinary. Well, um, and this piece is just remarkable. This where, this where I spend my Christmas holiday, I remember, in a basement in my home. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was always wake up very early, you know, before all my family get up, you know, I spend like, you know, five, six hours. And basically what you see is kind of, again, like, you know, uh, an image in which you see from the left, you have a character that uh, is sort of like Napoleon. Then you have uh, a native king, uh, an Aztec king. Then you have George Washington, you have a Native American, you have Cortez, and you have Christopher Columbus. And what I thought was this, I thought 
wow, what about, you know, we create this sort of like very friendly uh, image and this homage of the exploiters that somehow to tribute their respect to, to, to the great native culture, they learn how to do a tribal dance. You know, this is of course, you know, it's, that's what is, is in my mind. I don't know if I was able to convey it, you know, but, uh, you know, with all of this game of light and, and, uh, and shadow, I think uh, it came out of, uh, you know, some people may call it macabre, but I think it's very poetic, at least in my, in my point of view, you know, I didn't want to make anything macabre. I want to do something poetic with, with something that uh, unfortunately is the legacy of this country. Like, you know, the, the darkness of, uh, of like uh, the history of this country, like, you know. And I want to go back to something you were saying before about post-colonial uh, art, you know, making work dealing with the sort of post-colonial perspective, because, you know, yeah. in, in reality, if you come from sort of the, you know, curatorial background I come from, that's actually been a almost a dominant discourse um, for, you know, a couple of decades. But I think what you're accurate in pointing out, you know, sort of indirectly, is that it was always relegated to a certain type of art making, um, which was almost exclusively conceptual in its basis. Mm -hmm. um, and so these kind of post-colonial discourses operated in a somewhat um, not by their own choosing, but marginalized position within the art world. So that the ability to attract the attention of sort of a, a larger uh, group spectatorship wasn't really there. And I think what you're pointing out is that in the last five years, six years, in American, in American society writ large, in American mass culture, suddenly Absolutely. there is this um, impetus to begin having discussions about like colonialization and what a post-colonial uh, culture looks like and, and sort of try to break down in, in the area of public discourse, what it is we're talking about, what it is we want to build for the future. And, you know, I look at this drawing and I don't see it as satirical. I don't see it as a parody. I see it as something almost um, tragicomic. Well, that absolutely, you can you can call it this way, you know. But um, you know, we have to speak about uh, one thing, in my opinion, that uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. How the art world itself can exclude in the past twenty years all of these important discussion that they are happening today, like you know, uh, how you know they couldn't take technology. And the the art the artists that were making uh, artists and technology so serious. They were these were the only things that were happening in society. How can you how can you put on the closet a two major theme like this one? You know. So in a way, you know, going back to the complicit element that happened, like you know, in um, you know that is present in our society, like you know. And I think, thanks God, the art will open it up to, to, to all of this other matter because, I mean, I think it's exciting that we can talk about, you know, the legacy of, uh, of, of, of the founding father and, you know, why we are still today entangled into this, like, you know, taboo. I think it's, I think it's great. And maybe it's just the beginning of something much bigger, like, you know, in my opinion. But so in art Italy, is not just for an elitist group. Art, uh, you know, has to reach a much wider audience. And that's what I was trying to, to do for, uh, for part of my career, absolutely. I mean, I think that part of it, it's a longer discussion, but I, I, I suspect part of it has to do with, you know, the sort of transformation of the New York art world in the last 20 years you know, from a, a, a culture in which sort of intellectual and critical discourse led the discussion, you know, to a world in which really the sort of the transformation of art into an asset class um, uh, by, by financial um, sort of structure, by the financial markets, uh, really has taken over. 
uh, discourse. So it's it's no longer about the object; it's about the um, the deal. It's about the money. In fact, when you it's receive about the money, all, all the of, transaction. You know, when, yeah. when when you receive all of this newsletter, like you know, and I have to say, like that's the role that Brooklyn Rail, in my opinion, has to have to stay where it is because uh, because it's it's a pleasure to to read a newspaper that. 90% of, uh, of the content is just about flipping an artwork, you know, but instead it's, it's about culture, it's about dialogue, you know, because I yeah. believe that in long term, you know, whoever will do in great art, you know, they, they, they will win, you know, they, I mean, there's no question about it, you know. Uh, that is an inspiring thought, and I just caught the clock and realized we're we're already deep into question and answer territory. Oh, wow. I've, okay. I've just let us go on too long. So, um, I am going to look over into the chat and see who's got a good question or if someone wants to um, chime in right now. I, I did try to ask one of them about depicting the oppressor. Um, and ha, huh, somebody, somebody wants to know how a painting paired with digital technology is going to last oh. over 100 years. Well, I, 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 you know, I don't see any any difficulty on that, to be honest. Like you know, because also, if you know about painting, painting every thirty years, forty years, they need a restoration too. You know, so uh, and what you see behind uh, behind me, you simply swap, like you know, uh, a LED TV of fifty inches, which uh, you know, uh, you simply swap, uh, like you know, the technology. Very simple, like you know. And then, of course, you have to take care of, uh, of uh, like, you know, uh, transferring a file to a new format if it's necessary. Uh, I don't think visual image will disappear or moving image will disappear, you know. So, and, and by the way, these are also issues that the uh, collector asks when they own an Ansel Kiefer painting. They say, wow, you know, that's a great painting. But every three years, you know, there is a chunk of the painting that, you know, that fall on the floor, which, by the way, I love Ansel Kiefer, you know, I love it to death. But... You know, I think that uh, uh, art uh, need to be taken care. You know, and uh, and and I don't I don't see it. You know, in a society that every two years they swap in a thousand dollar phone, I don't see an issue. And my collector doesn't see an issue to swap a five hundred dollar screen every fifteen years. You know. Uh, I have another quick couple of quick questions. Um, influences on your work: Dario Fo or Beppe Grillo. Are these people? That you're thinking about? No, not really. Like you know, no, not really. Like I know that they are very irreverent character, but 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 not really. Like you know, I left Italy 20 years ago. You have to think that uh, I've been in this country and I've been so embedded into this culture because I really wanted to be part of this. Uh, you know, um, you know, this this culture, not just being secluded with, uh, you know, as an immigrant, you know, so um, I don't see it that way. I, I would say like, you know, that, you know, for example, I have a very early phase of my career, like William Kentry's, uh, um, uh, Ansel Kiefer, uh, there were big things, but also like uh, uh, Goya, I remember Daumier, I remember a lot of artists that somehow they have this sort of like uh, irreverent attitude and confidence about being free to speak out about uh, the world. Like, you know, for example, Chang Soutine was an artist. I'm not, a, I'm not a painter, but I do love to paint. And I, do, I, I, really, I really love the way they was conveyed, you know, uh, his subject, very brutal. Right. Um, actually, you know, for the rest of the questions, I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, to Jess from from Brooklyn Rail. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. So one of our questions comes from Stefano. Stefano, you should be able to unmute your mic now. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I mean, there you go. It's been a long time. <laughs> Good to see you. Oh, Stefano. Oh, wow. What a, what a pleasure. Well, it was a pleasure for me to, to see all this. As you can see, it's getting dark in Bologna. Anyway, um, well, half of my question you already replied to, the other half was, are you going to jump on the wagon of the NFT or not? If I'm going to jump into the world of NFT? Yes. Oh, wow. 
Well, uh, listen, like, you know, I think that before jumping in the world of NFT, um, people should do uh, quite a bit of research. You know, I, I've been listening a lot of like, uh, you know, like a lot of bad uh, press, you know, just like focusing on uh, how much money this sold for. You know, to me, my, uh, uh, my approach was like to start learning where everything started. You know, for example, I get into a year ago, cyberpunk literature. I, I went to read uh, um, um, Snow Crash by Stevenson, which was uh, considered one of the main sources for crypto artists. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to read uh, William Gibson, Neuromark is another, another uh, book that uh, the crypto community thinks uh, is uh, very inspirational. And, uh, you know, I did uh, my research, uh, but not just looking at uh, how much uh, NFT sells for. I look at who were the artists that uh, somehow they start this movement and why this movement start. I think in a way, if this movement start was because uh, uh, the traditional art world didn't give opportunity to this kind of artist. So, and in a way, they they were so strong and grouped together, and they were able to capture the art world by surprise. So, I, I don't want to speak in a negative way. I have a lot of respect for this community, and uh, and uh, I, I've been studying it for a year, Stefano, um, and uh, yeah, who knows? You know, who knows? But I definitely want to do my research. Eh? And by the way, Stefan is a very modest uh, person. He was the first person that wrote about my work, you know. And I remember, and I'm ex uh, extremely grateful, like, you know, so to you, Stefano. Oh, well, maestro. So I remember that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Stefano. Thank Ciao. You. Thank you, Stefano, for your question. Our next question comes from Daniela Habers. Daniela, you should be able to unmute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the great lecture. And my question was referring to the work you showed before, the painted one, where there was a cascade uh, ceiling. And if this is from a Roman church uh, where the priests were actually buried in the ceiling. Oh, well, actually like, you know, like my, um, it, it's interesting, like, you know, uh, in, in Italiano, they're called soffitti a cassettoni. This was a, a typical uh, uh, way of uh, creating the ceiling for the super wealthy uh, around be, be, before they start to make the frescoes. This was approximately in the 15th century or earlier, you know. Um, yes, of course, because, you know, again, like, you know, I'm, I'm embedded in American culture, but you know, I spend all of my youth, you know, walking on the street and looking at looking at the ceiling in the evening when the light were on, and I will see all of this private house in which you see the frescoes. Like you know, these are things that I that I carry with me. And in a, yes, you know, because of course in the Roman in the Roman spa they didn't have this kind of like ceiling. You know, it is again, it's a blending of. Uh, of like, uh, you know, I, I'm not an historian. I'm not trying to, to create uh, uh, truth, you know. I'm, I'm trying to interpret and to create surreal atmosphere to, to, to leave my narrative uh, to uh, take place. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank because it was, it was quite stunning, like these pirates or Roman emperors just rose yeah. from the water and then well, you saw the cascade ceiling, which was known to have uh, accommodated well, graves of priests. If you see cascade ceiling, you don't see a common citizen. You know that you are into a very expensive and detached environment. So from us, you see, my my studio doesn't have cascade ceiling. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Daniela. Fabulous question. Our next question comes from rail regular Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. Hi, thank you so much. Um, initially, I was thinking because of this sort of blend of fantasy, Baroque and earthiness, I, was, I found myself thinking of old Fellini films. 
Oh, absolutely. And, um, and then I realized that one of the things about those films is they always stay with you for a very long time after you see them. And this work in a different way, I'm gonna make a comment and you can tell me if I'm on or off. Okay. But I found them um, uh, very easy to enter and I can only imagine they're seeing them in, in person are very difficult to leave, which I'm wondering if that mirrors part of what thematically you're trying to achieve, which is there's these lights, there's a seduction, there's capitalism, there's so much stimulation, come on. And then once you're in it, the question is, how do you exit? Well, you know, listen, I, you know, it, this is a, again, I think it's a great compliment because usually like, you know, when, when you go to visit art, you just glance for one minute and then you go to the next and the next and the next. Of course, uh, uh, what I'm trying to create is something very seductive, like, you know, but, but seductive in a way that reflect my, my aesthetic, like, you know, and, and this idea to capture the viewer attention to, to, to convey my, my, my story. Like, you know, that, that's, that's, that's what they're really uh, trying to create. And if you call maybe like a nicely painted frame that somehow like, you know, try to, try to se seduce you, uh, absolutely is my goal. You know, I want that, you know, that the viewer spend time on, uh, on this world because again, I believe my call for art was not, not simply to sell a painting, but was more to, to you know, to comment about our society, to, to answer to some of the questions that maybe they're also impossible to answer for myself. Fellini was an incredible influence for me. You know, it's an, it's an obsession, it's an obsession, like, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, this uh, magical uh, atmosphere, you know, they contain so much meaning, like, you know, um, but uh, I don't know how directly they influence me, mm. but if you tell me, you know, if it was an influence on me, absolutely. And I love them to death, you know, I love them to death. I don't know, maybe it's this like uh, nostalgic uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, the circus, uh, environment there is there is only some darkness uh, you know and and this uh, idea that uh, of decadence that uh, is masked from the luxury of the of the dolce vita you know there is there is an enormous amount of sadness in fellini's movie in my opinion you know so and i i tend to be attracted also into sad uh, unresolvable questions like you know so that's uh thank you thank you thank Great. you so much thank you so much our next question comes from another lovely nsc regular ge schwartz you should be able to unmute your mic okay. good afternoon and thank you so much for this exciting presentation i am ecstatic about it i I, I, I saw you mentioned earlier, you mentioned obviously Abel Gantz because of the work there and of course, King Kong. Uh, I was wondering what other films have in, in kind of informed the way you're working in your project that, that really do mirror our, our great American vulgar exceptionalism. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking of even, even films far-fledged like, you know, are, uh, uh, like Brazil. And um, and then even Ibar Bergman saw those in tinsel, you know, and things like that. Yeah, you know, you know, one of the things I definitely forget was uh, the Fellini film that you know. But uh, I'm talking about like you know for, you know, I, I was you know like German expressionists for sure, like you know like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. You know, I did many many presentation at the university with uh, I don't know this kind of like uh, this kind of like. Uh, uh, unresolved perspective, this kind of like character that they are uh, really grotesque. For example, another movie that uh, that I think was very important for me uh, was called The Man Who Laugh. Oh, yes. A German, uh, but you know, I need to think about it. Like, you know, so th there is definitely more influence on, uh, on uh, you know, because I believe there is a lot of nostalgia also in my work. You know, people see always the, the satire and, and, and the irony and the beautiful, you know, 
uh, colors, but uh, I mean, there's a lot of like, uh, you know, rediscovering a theme that, uh, that they are not very uh, honorable, you know, so not very honorable for any country, you know, and I don't mean to criticize just America because of course, you know, you know, my country, they did awful things, you know, but I do like to, to, to bring attention to the viewer that, uh, that, you know, like there is a lot of important meaning to discover that you often, you're not going to discover in the high school textbook because they are, they're full of censorship, like, you know, so, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm thinking about other, other film, you know, but, uh, in general, I'm, I was really a, attracted by the by the the silent film you know the silent film for the reason that uh, that the actor they, they, they had to overact to convey a uh, meaning and for some reason I, I'm not interested at the moment to give them a voice to this character so um, but yes you know like I, I'm such a curious person like you know that, that, that anything unconsciously can influence me. For example, I was when we were talking about uh, these NFTs. One of the most exciting things that I discovered through NFTs was to discover the cyberpunk uh, literature. And I remember I became obsessed with the word metaverse. I would wake up in the morning and say, "Metaverse, metaverse. What does it mean? The universe beyond the so and." And I felt, wow, just to have the excitement, to have something new on my hand that I can manipulate, you know, it's so fantastic. That, 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 that's what, I, that's what I, I look like, you know, because even to be an artist, uh, when you start to be, let's say, successful, it can become the most boring world in the, job in the world, like, you know. So to me, I decide that my goal is not just to be successful, but to be excited, you know, to wake up in the morning, get off of bed early in the morning because I like to wake up early and be excited and discovering new things. Taking risks, creating virtual reality experience, which are very costly and they don't bring a dime often, okay? But I do like to put myself always into a question mark situation that I need to, to try new things, you know? So, and the pandemic helped, you know? And for, you know, I know a lot of people suffered tremendously, but the fact that there was no art fair, there were no traveling, there was no, all of these kind of things, it was, it, it was to be again 25 years old, in my opinion, you know? So I can talk forever. So maybe oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Our last question of the day comes from our publisher and artistic director oh, no. of the Brooklyn Rail, Fong Bui. Fong, you should be able to unmute. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Federico. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you, Dan. Um, oh, thank you. That's been yeah, great. Sounds great. Every time I see you, I just want to um, say like what Tony the Tiger in Frosted Flakes, remember the cereal? It's great. Yeah. <laughs> because oh. in Vietnamese, we had Great. That. Exactly, it's great, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I um, I I never saw it, but I barely came to this country. But a friend of mine have attended to um, Radio City Hall when the whole entire Albert Gans um, yes. screen Napoleon was staying. You saw that the New York Film Festival. Yep. Oh man, but you didn't see the one in the CD in the music hall, man. Did you see that? Yes, that's exactly what I saw. Wow! So did you know that the the uh, the, the music was composed by um, Francis Ford Coppola's father? Yes, son. Is it the son? Yes. Amazing. Anyway, I saw that in Vietnam uh, in in boarding school. Um, with three projection. With three projector, yeah. It's amazing, and uh, never it never escaped me whatsoever. Even till this day, I still remember Albert. Oh, I can believe it. Yeah. Who played Napoleon? It's amazing. There is a lot of speculation that you know it's been manipulated in many many times. It's been 
presented in a shorter version, and that was part of the reason of the failure of yep. uh, of uh, of of the film outside France. Because in France, the first screening was super successful. And by the way, Francis Bacon it seems that he was there for the first screening and was credited this where the idea of the trick that came from him. Yes, he did mention that. That's right. Um, but my, uh, I don't know, I have a question because your work seems to, uh, in everyone else, make terrific references. But the one I was thinking of too then uh, was our late friend Leon Gollum, you know? Oh, oh wow. And I think there's some thing that I thought of also just because that, that very much of the, um, you know, this, it, it, it's never really about the, the clarity that divides truth and false and evil and good. You know, that line, that line is so incredible with that tiny strand of hair. And I can't help but the thing of the, the few lines of Baudelaire at one o'clock in the morning, you know, that prose poem then. Mm -hmm. um, souls of those whom I have loved. Souls of those whom I have sung, strengthen me, sustain me, keep me from the vanities of the world and its contaminating fumes. And you, dear God, grant me grace to produce a few beautiful verses to prove to myself that I'm not the lowest of men, that I am <laughs> inferior to those whom I despise. Remember that? <laughs> That's <Wow>. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so, but anyway, Thank you, Fed. Thank you, guys. Thank you all uh, um, for being here. It was here. great. It was great to interact with everyone. Guys, thank you so much. Eh? Grazie mille. Grazie. Grazie. A presto. Yes. All right, moving to poetry. At the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Royoan Noel, to the stage. He is the author of Invisible Movement, New Rican Poetry from the 60s to Slam, published by University of Iowa Press, as well as eight books of poetry, including Buzzing Hemisphere and Transversal, both with the University of Arizona Press. As a translator of Latin American poetry, he has been a finalist for the National Translation Award and the Best Translated Book Award. Um, his international performances include Poesie Festival of Berlin, Barcelona Poesie, and the Toronto Biennial of Art. And his work has been selected for exhibition at the Museum of the City of New York, the Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico, and Taller Boricua. Um, you should be able to unmute. Gracias. Gracias. Molecular modular, lockdown breakdown, DNA sequence of SARS-CoV. Quebranto de cuarentena, secuencia de ADN del SARS-CoV. Ah, you remember when things went viral. Acuérdate de aquel sueño viral. Can you find lifelines in the death spiral? Con vida estás en pírrico espiral. Goddess, who will document your retiral? Guerreras, ahogarán al admiral. Time yet for the performative eye roll. Tiempo es por fin del guiño neuronal. Are silences in lines enough spacing? Algo en silencio entre líneas pasa. Can writing be no contact? with tracing. 
cuando se escribe sin contacto, es traza. Graphics matter most when self-erasing. Grafía del yo es borradura crasa. Too soon on all fours to start embracing. Tarde es para el que ñangotao abraza. Are solemn pages ready for their screen? Ante pantallas, la página es condena. Can quatrain somehow rhyme with quarantine? Cuarteto, rimará con cuarentena. Gray skies can sometimes signal the unseen. Gris cielo al fin, o revelación plena. Trauma was always written in between. Trauma es lo que el azar desencadena. As digital as a corpse, corpse. orgasm. Ay, digital cadáver y su orgasmo. Can poetry be both fold and spasm? ¿Cuál poesía? ¿De pliegue o de espasmo? Gravitas can grow its own sarcasm. Gritos de lucha se oyen sin sarcasmo. Terrors are holes since everyone has them. Terrenos del terror, donde me plasmo? Am I ready for a modular song? Atento estoy ante el modular canto. Can a modular song ever be wrong? Con musa modular cabrá un quebranto. Grow molecules into a chain that long? Grandes moléculas se aferran tanto. Trembling cells will become a voice. How strong. Tantas células dan voz al espanto. And I'll leave you with this, something a little quieter. This was uh, improvised in my backyard here in the South Bronx. And then transcribed into the book. But I was very silent when I'm thinking about poetics of transcription. Ave, lockdown song. Canto de cuarentena, improvising, improvisando, el Bronx. The birds are back. Volvieron las aves. Ya tú sabes, comienza otra conversación posible. A new conversation is possible. Con el yo interior, with the I within, without what I had. Sin lo que tenía, but with what I am, pero con lo que soy, me atrevo, I dare, improvisar to improvise some future skies, ciertos, cielos, futuros. ¿Qué más hay? What else is there to do mientras los pájaros y el tráfico se pelean? While the birds and the traffic fight it out in the shadow, of the Bruckner Expressway. Bajo la sombra de la autopista Bruckner en el sur del Bronx, in the South Bronx, donde generaciones de mi gente were generations of my people. Han luchado, have struggled, han sobrevivido, have survived. Libre albedrío de cantar. 
the sovereignty of song even amid the distortion of these technologies. Aún en plena distorsión de tantas tecnologías, otro cuerpo es posible. Another body is possible. Cuerpos no productivos que no funcionen. Unproductive bodies that don't always work, not work in other ways. Desde otro tipo de redes. No te me enredes con lo que te digo. Don't get tied up with what I'm saying. I mean, tying up is okay if it's consensual. Enredarse y atarse está bien si es consensual. Pero me interesa lo natural. But I'm interested in the natural flow of the song, el flujo de este canto en su quebranto, broken but finding its way, pero hallándose sus propios semantemas, its own semantic properties, other ways to inhabit, otras maneras de habitar, no need to exhibit, no hace falta exhibir, vivir dentro de sí y para sí por una vez, to live within oneself and for oneself for once. Enhorabuena. It's about damn time. Hubo cruces. Hubo diásporas. Hubo desplazamientos. Hubo muertes. There were crossings. There were diasporas. There were displacements. There were deaths. And there will be more. Y más habrá. No obstante, aquí estamos. Nonetheless, here we are, cantándoles a los que no están, singing for those who aren't here, pero que están, but that are here after all, pero que están aquí después de todo, como el eco del canto de esos pájaros, like the echo of the bird song you'll never hear, que nunca oirás porque lo llevas dentro de ti, because you carry it within you, from island to island, de isla en isla, para evitar lo posible, to inhabit the possible. And it goes on, but I'm doing something different just for Brooklyn Rail. I'm improvising the last part of the improvisation. It's the, there, but wait, there's more of poetry readings. We poets can do it too. We can fake our technologies of the voice. Let's try it. I hear that Brooklyn Rail is trying to amplify marginalized voices. So I have a tool for you. Amplification is its tools and so is Zoom. But tell you what, let's try this. No more megaphone, no more smartphone. Let's go to where the action happens. I said, I improvised in my backyard. Well, let me show you the sonic boulevard, the space of my embodiment. This is the South Bronx, the generations of my people referenced in the poem. I guess you have to negotiate the reference in the performance to my preference for a faux site specific approach. Yes, I do that here. How gentrifier of me. We poets do all the stuff artists do and put in our CVs. Just nobody hears about it because it becomes smartphone dissonance. I agree with the artist. It's hard to find a way to bring something to digital space, which avoids that coldness, putting the sexy into the digital, perhaps is a poetics, or perhaps it's just another stage of capitalism, like the Bruckner Expressway overhead, like the construction that never stopped, even in pandemic times, o como los flamingos, rosadito, plástico, que me mandó mi mamá de Florida. Diasporican plastic flamingos in the South Bronx, 
that some kind of situational irony, Mr. Cameron, give me an appropriate art critical term to encompass my poetics. I can find a fee for your time. Can we find our fees for any of our times? Can we reclaim a time for the voice? Where is the voice? Someplace in the South Bronx <laughs> of the mind, como diría Perlinghetti. Gracias. Thank you so much for that wonderful and wild and just all around amazing performance. And thank you, Dan. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, everyone who tuned in today and for your excellent questions. Um, the Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects like this one, free, relevant, and independent. Uh, and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading with Mary Riley, featuring poetry read by Tongo Eisen Martin, Anujika, Sai Howa, Jack Jung, and Lojeta Lejanaku. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dan. So Dan and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Salut, Federico. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Come on. It was great. It was very great, Federico. I'm very, very happy you you were so good. And uh, <laughs> I enjoy to see your next exhibition if uh, if I come in the USA. That's you're welcome anytime, Pascal. Yeah, anytime. I know. Thanks, Pascal. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Bye.